Have you ever noticed that some elevators do not have a 13th button for their 13th floor? Would you believe that some buildings purposefully exclude the number 13 on control panels just because it's often considered an unlucky number? Seriously, people do this. It's been well documented. The Otis Elevator Company even tweeted about it as a fun fact for Friday the 13th one year. Human beings take this precaution. Why? Because we don't want to jinx an elevator which in the US kills a whopping 30 people per year? Mostly technicians? Automobiles kill around 30 people every few hours, and yet the odometer doesn't skip numbers ending in 13. Maybe that's the problem. Perhaps it's because there is something disquieting about elevators. Have you ever felt a small flurry of panic when an elevator randomly shook or made a little too much noise while you were aboard or the doors took a suspicious amount of time to open? Did you know that the first time someone died on an elevator was on December 15th, 1883? A young boy was, oh, oh God. Oh God, someone opened these doors. I'm not saying that riding on an elevator with no number 13 is going to keep me safe. I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. And so are the folks over in Japan. You see, there, the Japanese character for four is she, which sounds like the character she, meaning death. Sort of like this is bark, but this is also bark. If you're riding up an elevator in Japan, there may be a 13 button, but there might not be a four button. In the first Silent Hill game created by Kichiro Toyama, there is an elevator in a three-story building that you'll have to pop in and out of a few times while you explore. Select a floor, take a look around. Select a floor, take a look around. Select a floor. Today, I'd like to invite you on a bit of a sanity check. I have a cautious reverence for elevators, especially ones that find me in video games. However, I don't know if I am alone here, if I have some conditioned fear of elevators, or if anyone else has ever been weirdly spooked or awestruck at a lift in a game. Much like liminal spaces, there is an underlying human familiarity with elevators. They are a common place that we wait, a space in between destinations, a living room we all share, if only for a fleeting moment in passing. A place to stop and willingly be trapped for the sake of convenience, and in doing so, surrender ourselves to being temporarily confined with strangers to whatever the game has in store for us, or to our own thoughts. And so, in an effort to, to both understand this odd idiosyncrasy I seem to have here, and potentially convince you that video game elevators are every bit as much of a storytelling and gameplay tool as any other in-game mechanic, I have decided to compile every gaming elevator that has ever stuck with me, as well as examples that you have pointed out that I have missed. Today, I want to talk about how elevators can bolster the world building, how they can force players to stew in their own thoughts, how they can affect combat and pacing, how some games use them as an opportunity for dialogue, how some games blah 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 Don't worry, we'll, we'll circle back to this. And as icing on the cake, we will talk about a recent example that many of us likely remember as one of the most enchantingly beautiful views in a game. And another example that is the complete and total opposite of this. I invite you to take a deep seat, get comfortable, find a blanket, and allow me to take you on a journey through all of this and so much more. Since I have over 50, sweet Jesus, 50 examples, I've neatly filed them into some fun categories to break the video up into different portions. Floors, if I wanted to be quirky, but that's that's a little bit on the a little bit on the nose, so I, I'm probably probably not going to do that. The City of Tears and Hollow Knight awakened something in me. Finding it for the first time was like finding a moment from the past trapped in time, paused by an unending rainstorm. There was a pristine yet ancient aura to this place that demanded respect. The elevators perfectly illustrate that with their classical dated design. They're perfectly preserved antiques. They scream old, but untouched. Just listen to how the chains rattle and roll and how the cab trembles and shakes as it comes to a sudden stop. It shouldn't be working, but it is. The skewers on top remind you to tread carefully and patiently wait for it to arrive. Again, this place is lovely, but it is equally treacherous. 
And there are a lot of lifts that go beyond a simple mode of transportation or a loading screen and instead act as a garnish to embellish an area. That heavy audio from the dead cells elevator full with sparks to accentuate the blistering speed of the cab to keep things moving on your 10th run today. The claustrophobic gothic cage in Bloodborne that leaves you with only the echoes of the chains and your thoughts as it drops you down into the darkness. The bird cages in Death's Door that, well, well you're a bird, you see, so it, it only makes sense that you'd ride in a bird cage. Yeah, you get it. That shit's clever, right? In the game Catherine, the cab that Vincent rides in his dreams between levels is designed after a Catholic confession booth, and in it, you'll answer some awkward, inescapable questions like, Do you consider yourself a pervert? Be honest now. <laughs> well, which one? This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Portal's elevators are the perfect complement to the Aperture facilities. In Portal 1, they're symmetrical, sterile, padded, safe, desaturated, efficient. They serve the purpose of not influencing test results while simultaneously protecting test subjects from themselves. In Portal 2, they're equally as clinical and efficient in design, almost reminiscent of a vaccine vial, and yet they're overgrown and often not functioning properly. The facility is long overdue for maintenance, illustrating that an uncomfortable amount of time has passed since your first visit here. And speaking of uncomfortable, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the absolute resume that Metroid brings to the table. And it's because Metroid knows when to take the steak off the grill. Whereas some games want the heavy chains and the mechanical whirring to keep the player's attention while they wait, the rides here are generally hushed. Metroid devs don't overcook things. They have always understood that the real horror of the series lies in the quiet junctures before action unfolds. Whether you're on Zebes, ZRD, Talon 4, there is always a subtle atmospheric breath to the environment, a quiet that's not quite quiet. And it's because of this, a slow tension builds and weaves its way through your exploration until it's finally broken up by the shrill sounds of Samus getting hurt. or the soundtrack has signaling danger. You only realize in those moments how quiet it's been. The stillness contrasts the panic. It percolates an inescapable unease, and the elevators act as an accelerant to that unease, forcing you to pause and just exist in this fragile silence. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Yeah, so elevators are kind of fun to fight on. And the first people to realize this were the good folks at the game studio Taito in 1983. They dropped a game called Elevator Action, where you could fill the shoes of Agent 17 and fight your way down buildings, popping in and out of elevators the whole way. The game saw commercial and critical success, topping out as the highest grossing arcade game in Japan for three whole months. It even got an edgy remake a few years later, full with graffiti, boobies, and Dark Souls dogs. What made the series so stupidly fun was how the elevator elevators could be leveraged to find different in and outs in combat. You could shoot just as the cab was dropping down to give yourself a safe shot, escape danger if you were trapped, toss a grenade down an empty shaft, run across the top of a cab but be ready, enemies can use them too. Elevator action influenced several future platformers, but as best I could find, the first elevator to do elevator combat the way we typically see it done nowadays is in Streets of Rage. What made this special was three main attributes that would go on to trickle down into future elevator sequences. The first is the limited space available on the lift that was close quarters at all times. Less breathing room means less time to make decisions, which is what makes the elevator pitch in Super Hot one of the trickier levels in the game. Every move has to be intentional. There's even less margin for error than there usually is, and this was true in Streets of Rage as well. The second is that you could launch enemies off the edge before they were actually knocked out, saving time, creating more space with less effort, and making you feel like a cat knocking shit off a shelf, except 
except it's criminals. The only thing that can top kicking Draugrs off this lift in God of War is kicking them off this lift later in the game when you actually need to save time. When I first played, I remembered the previous elevator, I remembered my old strategy, and I felt clever for using it here when it's especially helpful. The third is that in both Streets of Rage 1 and 2, every time you go up a floor, the view changes until you're finally rewarded with a stunning city skyline or a sunset bathing the horizon in color. It only makes sense that as you go up, the view changes, so instead of being placed in an enclosed box, you are given a lovely visual reminder of your triumph. And while it's not a one-to-one -one analog to this, I think this late game elevator fight in Nier Automata accomplishes the same thing. At this point in the plot, we are following two characters headed to the same destination. You'll start with this character, and as the fight progresses, you'll transition to suddenly fighting Airborne as the other character. You act out this chaotic dance back and forth as the transitions between them become more frequent, signaling that these two are getting closer, ever upward, ever closer to this final crescendo. It both rewards your effort and paces the sequence beautifully. Man, I've got to play Nier Automata again. When all of these strands weave together, elevators become a genuinely gripping place to have combat that feels simultaneously claustrophobic, calculated, and climactic. And speaking of climactic, let me tell you about... If you take a few turns off the beaten path in the Stanley Parable, you'll find yourself face to face with this set of doors. It is not labeled. There is no floor indicator on the outside. In fact, this entire room doesn't seem to have any specified purpose. Indiscriminate documents lay about the floor. Some light bulbs are out. The entire room feels forgotten. And yet, here you are with only questions to be answered. So. You do it. You open the doors. You board that cab. You press that button. The doors close and you wait. The cab shivers as it blisters upward floor after floor. Time passes and it passes and still you wait. Waterlogged with anticipation, bewildered by the thought of what might be on the other side of those doors once you arrive. And so you wait for what feels like forever. How impossibly tall must this building be? You were assuming this game takes place on Earth, but what if everything you assumed about this game was wrong and you- Has the game frozen? Like... Th th this is getting a little ridiculous. Son of a- what other game mechanic can deliver a joke quite like this? Certainly not a skill tree or 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 or, or, or stairs. Well, actually, there is a there is a pretty good staircase joke uh, in in Final Fantasy VII Remake. You see, Shimmer security is tight, so the game lets you choose: go up the easy way and potentially get caught, or sneak up 59 floors untouched and burn some calories along the way. You have got to be shitting me. At first, you're flying up them, but eventually... This sucks! I wanna go back! My personal favorite elevator gaff that folks recommended to me comes from System Shock. You walk on, and, well, I, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna play it for you. It's the music that does it for me. There's also, um, that's... That, that's the only three video game examples I have on this floor, and, uh, and one was about stairs. Kind of a bummer. I wish there were more, because I can think of a ton of funny elevator scenes in movies, like that time Spider-Man had to stand full costume next to this dude when his web stopped working. Or in The Nice Guys, when they ride up to find a missing girl, only to get right back on and awkwardly wait after deciding they had no interest in saving the day. Elevators aren't just for action or ambience, they're strange little rooms that you can force characters to stand in awkwardly or use to completely subvert expectations, and I'd love to see more games use them for comedic effect. You're going to love it to death. You're gonna love it until, you, until it kills you, till you're dead. <laughs> All right, I don't know whether you're, uh, you're picking up on what I'm saying there, yes. but...
I really liked how in Mirror's Edge, you get to do parkour in an empty elevator shaft and how in Ultra Kill, every level ends with you dropping instead of riding down deeper into this hell. It just bookends each stage perfectly. Oh, and in Portal 2, when you fall down the elevator shaft and see floor after floor after floor of the facility pass you by, the amount of time that you fall lends itself to the sheer scale of the aperture facilities and it- <laughs> I think we forgot something. One of the first side quests you'll come across in 2022's Anno Mutationum is a missing persons case. A suspect in a crime you were investigating was seen on camera getting on the elevator of this apartment building at floor 8, rides down past floor 7, does not get out, but by the time the cab reaches floor 6, it is empty. Somehow, this man has vanished into thin air between floors 7 and 6. So, you retrace his footsteps to floor 6, only to discover that there is something a bit incongruent about this floor. The security detail is gone. The police tape was never there. There is no floor number displayed above the elevator, simply the word yes. But once you leave that floor, things return to normal. The security is back. For some reason, this sixth floor seems to exist outside of reality. Should you follow a subtle clue, you'll find that by visiting certain floors in the correct order, your cab will slip into a place somewhere outside of our plane. It's remarkably similar to an old internet ghost story called The Elevator Game, where in the real world, if you board an elevator alone in a 10-story building and ride the cab to floors 2, 6, 2, 10, then 5, on floor 5, a strange woman is said to walk on board with you. You were instructed not to look at her or speak to her no matter what she says to you. Simply hit the button for the first floor. Once you get there, quietly get off and leave the building. However, there is a chance that this woman will instead take you to the 10th floor, where when the door is open, you'll find the other world, a place that people claim if you get out of the elevator to look around, any previous employees or signs of life will be gone. The building's power will be out, and should you choose to look out the window, you will be greeted by an empty void. Your surroundings will only be visible because they are eerily illuminated by the distant glow of a giant red cross over the horizon gleaming through the windows. This is obviously a folktale hogwash, completely untrue, something Jonathan Frakes would refute at the end of an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, a waste of time and electricity. But isn't there something just so distressing? about the thought of being alone in a small room that almost magically just delivers you somewhere. We place a lot of trust in elevators, and this is a trust that many titles exploit to manufacture skin-crawling moments. Take this bit in Silent Hill 2. Up until this point in the game, elevators have only served the purpose of transporting you to your destination and providing a bit of creepy ambience like everywhere else. However, on this particular ascent, time seems to stop and you hear... Typically, rides from floor to floor take a few seconds, but for an impossible three minutes, the cab seems to travel outside of space and time, and you're met with interference from this otherworldly game show broadcast. I say, unlucky challenger today is James, James Sunderland! This sequence works because it's not scary per se, it's just out of place, bizarre, unexplainable. The same can be said of the fourth floor suddenly existing on this three-story building in the first Silent Hill like we mentioned at the beginning. This shouldn't be possible, and yet here you are, with no answers and a very pushable fourth floor button. Expectations are everything, which is what makes these two sequences in Dead Space so great but in a slightly different way. Early in Dead Space 1, Isaac is vibing and then... <laughs> Early
really in Dead Space 2. Once again, Isaac is just minding his own business, and then... What the fuck? People ought to try using the damn stairs sometime. But it's not just the scare itself that makes this work. It's the anticipation you feel with every future elevator in the Ishimura or the Sprawl. Much like the rig menu isn't a pause button that can protect you from danger, the elevator isn't just a place to wait for the game to load. By making it clear early that something like this can happen, Dead Space doesn't let you fully rest here. Just like Metroid, they build tension to a fever pitch. A lot of other moments like these rely on the cab trapping you in some way. There's the metaphysical panic attack on the gondola in Celeste. The escape in Inside where you have to find a way out of this crashed lift before you drown. The Metal Gear Solid ambush where suspiciously the elevator is over its weight limit even though you're alone and you definitely haven't messed up your New Year's diet. Shortly after, you hear that some invisibility suits have gone missing and then you begin to put it together. The guys who stole my stealth prototypes are in there with you! Too late, Snake! Now die! There's also that one elevator in Omori where, no, no, I, I won't spoil that. You deserve to be hurt like I was. Remember, no version. Uh oh, sorry, sorry, I had a text, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, I forgot about this floor. Nothing to see here, moving on. Y'all ever play Mass Effect? I haven't, yet. But I'll tell you one thing, you all love the elevator scenes in this series because instead of just being stuck with your thoughts or being served a fade to black between floors and a loading screen, the devs capitalize on this unused time and have the characters do what actual people sometimes do in elevators. Awkwardly chit chat. Tally, why do you Quarians wear those suits all the time? Is it a cultural thing? No, living in the clean environment of the flotilla has weakened our immune systems. The environmental suits protect against diseases. Oh, well. I'll uh, try not to sneeze. You get different dialogue options depending on who's writing together, and frankly, it's cool as hell, and it helps both flesh out the characters and adds an authenticity to the world. Until it's sometimes broken up by extremely slow load times. These will be adequately protected. And I think a lot of devs have realized that elevators are free real estate for character interaction. If we have to wait for the elevator, why shouldn't the characters do it too? How do they handle passing that time? Is the conversation flowing or is it tense? Do they hold the elevator door for more people or do they awkwardly ignore them and let the doors close? I always think of that scene in God of War where Kratos doesn't want to look at Atreus after they both see an uncomfortable truth in hell. I didn't see anything. You did not see me with someone. An old man. What old man? Can we go? Yes. Very well. By show of hands, would you rather this or a loading screen. The threat of awkward silence wrings good dialogue out of characters. You get a similar bit in chapter one of Deltarune as we slowly see Susie break out of her shell. In FF7 Remake, if you do take the elevator at Shinra instead of worst route ever, you're treated with some scenes that are only possible if Cloud, Tifa, and Barrett see the human side of Shinra. Normal people work here, fathers with families, mothers trying to pay rent, not just faceless thugs and pompous corporate supervillains. With our heroes having seen this, you get a glimpse into Tifa's uncertainty and Barrett's confident philosophical resolve. I know it's not exactly a revelation, but it's easy to forget. A good man who serves a great evil is not without sin. He must recognize and accept his complicity. There are so many elevators in games that book in big scenes, and by having some dialogue to show how the characters are filling the silence before and after these things happen goes a long way in making them feel more human. Unless the point is for you 
to fill that awkward silence. I did a video around this time last year about the space in between, how a lot of titles, from soft games especially, place a large distance between a difficult enemy or challenge and the respawn point, effectively making the player wait every time they want to retry that boss. This causes frustration for many, but others almost seem to be oddly grateful for the forced timeout. It gives them a chance to take a deep breath, come up with a strategy, and not just fly in guns blazing. Being given an unskippable break to reflect might help you calm down if you're frustrated, but it might also be uncomfortable if you've just met with an ominous truth. Do you remember in Undertale where Alphys is walking with you towards the final area and she seems a bit reluctant to share something with you? When she finally does and you realize that you are about to commit a terrible act, the very next thing that happens is you board this elevator. And for a painful 20 seconds, you descend down into the city. No music, no dialogue, it's just the sound of the cab moving and your thoughts swirling to digest this horrible truth. Games throw a lot of information at us. We're constantly pelted with stimulation, but scenes like this force you to stop and consider everything you've been doing. The elevator ride in Danganronpa reminds you that despite the telenovela levels of tomfoolery in this plot, every time you've taken this descent, there was one less person. Someone is about to die. The Mirror's Edge elevators provide a natural ebb and flow in the action so that you can recompose yourself and process what just happened. That final plunge into the abyss and hyperlight drifter that calls you to reflect on the journey that's brought you here. And this journey, my friends, is about to meet its end. Let's step back on the cab one last time and see what lies on the final floor. Last year, when Elden Ring released, in the first 24 hours before there were any essays or guides, and I was kind of staying offline to avoid any spoilers, I spontaneously happened upon this lift deep in the woods. I thought, ooh, okay, I've got a little mini dungeon. Let's see what's up. I got on, it took off, and then it just kept going. Floor after floor passed. Eventually, the tunnel opened up to reveal stunning architecture buried seemingly 20 stories underground, and yet still the platform plunged. There was bedrock, and then finally, somehow, miraculously, a starry sky and a forgotten city tucked away quietly miles below civilization. Magical is the only word that seemed to fit the description of this place when I saw it for the first time. This wasn't a side dungeon in a game, it was a discovery in a boundless, untouched world that had seemingly just doubled inside, and I had stumbled upon it accidentally. There aren't many elevator examples that can fit this scale category. I don't need to explain it. When done right, moments like these speak for themselves. They make you feel small in the universe. And in fact, several of you recommended this example to me all this time later. But what I found a bit curious is that for all of the recommendations I received for the seal for a river well, I never heard a single mention of what I feel is the opposite of this elevator, and by far, the one that haunts me the most. Did you know that if you were to place Mount Everest's tallest point on the deepest part of the ocean floor, not only would it be completely submerged, it wouldn't even come close to breaching the surface. In a verticality contest on this planet, the ocean beats the land. This is a fact that when I seriously consider it, makes my stomach turn upside down. And it is a fact that Soma illustrates to an eerily detailed degree. I won't spoil any major plot points here. There was a genuinely fascinating dialogue in this ride, but we will keep that muted and instead talk about how Soma portrays a horrific journey to the bottom of the sea. 
The descent begins at around 100 meters underwater, over 300 feet, the epipelagic zone. The water is warm, sunlit, full of life. This is what you see if you look down while scuba diving. But the lift is moving at a brisk pace, 12 meters per second, about 28 miles per hour. Algae, bubbles, and sediment all soar by. The cable whirls and whips, tethered to somewhere you do not belong, dragging you down ever closer to the ocean floor. You look up, and now it's darker. You're in the mesopelagic zone, appropriately nicknamed the twilight zone. The temperature is dropping, and the pressure is rising. Exterior lights flip on, signaling your entry into the bathypelagic zone, known as midnight because there is no more natural light here. Sunshine on the brightest day of the year has no hope of ever reaching it this far down. The only light you'll find here is either coming from the cab or... Hello, Catherine. Or bioluminescent animals, beautiful little aliens to light your way as you press further and further into their world and even beyond. Once you get the lift working again, you continue, and you may notice that this descent has felt long. You've been on this elevator for much longer than any video game would dare keep you sitting still, and yet the ocean just seems to grow, swallowing you again and again. You're barely halfway, but you feel more far from home than ever before. This is another world, foreign and unwelcoming. The Abyss. Water temperature is near freezing. The pressure here is so tough on your suit that it begins to warp your vision. And then something happens that I will not spoil. When you wake up, there is a darkness that devours everything beyond an arm's reach of the cage. There are no glowing sea creatures. This place is alien even to them. You arrive. Decayed plants and animal remains now flow inches from your face. What was once a distant echo of the deep is now at your fingertips. If the seal for elevator was meant to fill you with wonder, this descent to sight Tao and Soma was almost certainly meant to fill you with dread. Both accomplished their goal of making you feel like a single grain of sand on a beach. However, where Elden Ring ignites your soul with curiosity for what lies over the horizon, Soma blindfolds you and plunges you so far from home that every cell in your body simply says, please, go back. And now that we've seen all nine floors, that's exactly what we're going to do now. I hope you've enjoyed our little tour of video game elevators today, and I'd like to think that next time you are alone with your thoughts on one, it causes you to take a deep breath and reflect. I hope if there is dialogue that it is either so awkward that the ride seems to take longer, or so gripping that it makes you wish these characters would open up to each other more often. I hope you got this reference because we are not stopping again. Remember to always wait for the cab to arrive. May your future elevator rides and horror games be as spooky as you want them to be, but please don't go riding up and down office buildings trying to no clip into the back rooms. Never forget that there is humor to be found in the little things. If you must fight in an elevator, make sure to move with purpose and enjoy the view at the top. And finally, appreciate and delight in the details. I genuinely can't thank you enough for coming along on this sanity check, and with any luck, you can see now why elevators and games captivate me the way they do. Perhaps you have some weird reverence towards them as well now. Or maybe I failed the sanity check. You win some, you lose some. Be sure to leave your I can't believe I literally just watched the 30 minute video on elevators comments. And if you can be the first person to tweet at me with the amount of times I used the word elevator in this video, you will win absolutely nothing. I've been Daryl. You've been a lovely audience. And I hope this video lifted you up if you were feeling down. That 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 was an elevator joke. Did you did you get that? That was an you did oh you got it. Okay. So you so you did get that. Okay. Okay, you got it. Okay, bye. 
Hey there, everyone. I hope your 2023 is off to a spectacular start. I apologize for this video taking so long to drop. It just, it somehow kept getting bigger and bigger and I couldn't stop it. I still can't, the video is still going. Anyways, the backlog is going well. Thank you all so very much for the support on that video. And uh, I'm having a ton of fun knocking out some games, some, some gems that I've completely missed over the years. If you like what you saw here today, consider joining me on Patreon. I make monthly bonus content, video editing, live streams where I show you the process of making these videos as well as other behind the scenes stuff. It's only a dollar a month, so click that orange link when it comes up if you're interested. A big thick thank you to the... <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. A big, thick thank you to this month's featured patrons. Robert McDermott, Wyatt Stalmark, Atlas, Fish Pockets, Sir Bubbles, Tobias Hartle, Bubble Nut McMuffin, and I am certainly going to mispronounce this, but Jean Chokrun, Jean Chokrun. JC, appreciate you. Thanks again for watching, take care, and have yourself a damn good one. Oh, oh, and I simply can't forget to mention the elevator in Outer Wilds.